Box. Box. Right here. <laughs> we sang about grace this morning. Guess what? The yeah, that's you. Anything comes naturally, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so we say about grace this morning. That's what I'm speaking about this morning. Grace. Amazing grace. As I go through this message, I want you to think about all the areas in your life where grace has touched you. God's grace. And it truly is amazing grace. Grace is a constant running theme all through the Bible. And it reaches its peak in the New Testament in Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The word translated grace is a Greek word, uh, charis. That's where we get the word charismatic or charisma. Um, it means favor, blessing, or kindness. And we can all show grace toward others in our life. And... Uh, when it comes, when it comes to uh, grace of God, it has a very special connotation. It's a very more powerful, um, has a more powerful meaning. God's grace is unmerited favor. He chooses to bless us rather than give us what our sin deserves. It's his compassion and his kindness toward us, toward the undeserving. We are the undeserving. We don't deserve all the blessings that God has given us. So many times people complain that they don't get what they think they need to get. I'm glad I don't get what I deserve. I'll put it that way. The only way any of us can go into a relationship with Jesus Christ is because of his grace toward us. God's grace is the great central act of agape love. Um, by which the plan of salvation is built on. The, the love and grace of God is the foundation of salvation, the plan of salvation. Grace began in the Garden of Eden when God killed an animal to cover up the sins, uh, the nakedness of uh, Adam and Eve. Um, and that was in Genesis 3.21. He could have easily, being God, just got rid of it right there, wiped out Adam and Eve, and started all over again. But he didn't. Why? His love. His infinite, um, unfathomable, um, uncomprehensible love toward man caused him to do what he did. His grace flows from that love. That river of grace runs all through the Old Testament when God instituted blood sacrifices, and it was the grace of God that, that forgave those who believed in him and followed him and trusted him. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Sinful man showed their faith by offering the sacrifices that God required. So God instit instituted grace. He's the inst instigator of of grace, and it's from him that all other grace flows. <coughs> God shows both mercy and grace, but they're not the same. Mercy withholds punishment. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. And I'm glad it works that way. I don't know about you, but I am so glad. I just praise God for his mercy and his grace toward me. God chose in mercy 
to cancel our sin debt by sacrificing his perfect, flawless, sinless son in our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That he might become the righteousness, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus Christ. But he goes even further than mercy and extends grace to his enemies. And we were his enemies. Romans 5.10 says that while we were yet enemies, he extended his grace and his love toward us. Grace is God uh, given the greatest treasure to the least deserving, which is every one of us. And this is what God, this is what makes God God's grace truly an amazing grace. Let's stand as we, we read our scripture today. It's um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, if you're already there. <coughs> only two verses. I usually use more than that, but I'm only using two today. Um, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Heavenly Father, I praise you. I give you glory that your grace covers I look back on my life and see all the sins that I committed and your grace by the blood of Jesus Christ covers all those sins. And I thank you, Lord. I cannot thank you enough. I just praise you that you have been so, so good to me and that you're so good to each and every one of the people here, that your grace is a never ending thing and you just continue to extend your grace to us. I pray that you be with me as I deliver this message. Give me the joy, the enthusiasm, and the love, and the passion to deliver this message as you would have me to. And I pray for everyone that hears this, that you convict them, and that you um, show them the message that you would have them to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I was studying for this message, I, I found a great illustration to show something that I really didn't fully understand in this scripture uh, until I started studying for this. By grace through faith. That I didn't really understand. By grace through faith. Imagine God's grace as an endless supply of water. We have as much water or grace as we need. For this illustration, I want to use it as, as water. Now let's say we need to water our garden. <coughs> So what are we going to do? How do we get the water from the spigot to the garden? We take a hose. We get up to the spigot, turn the hose on, we got it all, all the water we need, right? So God's grace is the water. Our faith is the hose. You follow me? Isn't that a great illustration? As long as we have the hose connected to the spigot, we have an endless supply of water. God's grace comes to us through faith. Just like the water goes to the garden through the hose. But the hose has to stay connected to the spigot. As long as our faith keeps us connected to God and we keep our eyes on Him and remain in obedience to Him and His Word, His grace will never run out for us. Amen? Isn't that an awesome illustration? I heard that this week and I was like, man, that just fits right in. So our response to salvation is faith. But even that is not of ourselves. The faith that we get is given to us from God, just like the grace or the hose and the water, as we're using this illustration. He made us the way we did so that we could learn to rely on him for all things. That's where our faith comes in, and that's how our faith grows, by knowing that we can rely on Him for all things. That's His grace. His grace allows us to know without question that we can rely on Him for all things. But sometimes we get into a predicament, into a trial or tribulation in our life, and we have doubts, right? And I do too. We have doubts. But we have to know God's Word assures us that we can always count on Him and His grace and His love to pro provide for all our needs. It's His gift of grace 
to us. And you can't see God's gift any other way than as a gift. <coughs> it's a gift. There's nothing we could ever do to earn it. Nothing we could ever do to make ourselves worthy to gain God's grace. So my first point in this is God is the source of grace. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Pay attention to that. Grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk up, uprightly. And that's a, an important part of that verse too. For them that walk uprightly. Uh, the connection between God's grace and his glory was in mind of in the mind of Paul when he wrote Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 he said we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God the Lord will give glory and grace he has an infinite supply of glory and grace he will give grace and glory in due time. He will give grace and glory as needed. He will give grace and glory to the full. And we can rest assured that he will give grace and glory with absolute certainty. How do we know that? The Bible tells us so. His word says, Jesus Christ is the fullness of both grace and glory. And as his chosen people, we will receive both grace and glory as a free gift from God. No good thing will he withhold from us. How else can we see God's grace other than a gift? It's something we don't deserve. I don't deserve anything God has given me. I mentioned earlier I've been here for a year. I don't deserve it. I, I absolutely don't deserve the pleasure and the honor of being pastor in this church. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve my wife that cooks so well. And is just an awesome wife. I don't deserve all of that. But it's God's grace. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We can expect <coughs> no goodness from this world. <coughs> because of our fallen nature, <coughs> we can expect no goodness. God's grace is freely given to us. And we can expect no good thing from this world, but every good and every perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father. The ultimate gift of goodness of any gift is measured on an eternal scale. We get a lot of good things here. We get uh, all the things that I mentioned is a, are a great gift from God by His grace. Um, our kids are a great gift from God. Our friends, um, our cars, our houses and things are a great gift from God, but we have to look at them on an eternal scale. Are those things going to take us into eternity? No. Are those things going with us into eternity? No. And I came up with the illustration of people winning the lottery. People that win the lottery or uh, get a great inheritance or something like that, that can be a great blessing. It can appear to be a great blessing, but on the other hand, a large sum of money can be a curse to some people. It can be the worst thing that could happen to somebody. Somebody could want money, and uh, that would be the worst thing that happened to them. So, so God is the source of all grace. That's my first point. My second point is the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of grace. The Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit of grace. Zechariah, turn to this chapter, to this verse for a second, if you would. Um, I want you to see something in this. Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. It's uh, toward the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Zechariah 10, verse or 12, verse 10. If you're there, say amen. Nobody's there yet. <laughs> Zechariah 12, verse 10. 
And this is God speaking. Are you there? Okay. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon <coughs> watch this, me. They shall look upon <coughs> me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And shall be in bitterness of him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. firstborn. Now like I said, this is a prophecy of Zechariah, the prophecy, and God is speaking uh, of the end times. The thing that stands out to me most about this verse is that God will pour out His Spirit of grace on Jerusalem after they realize that they have pierced Him. After they pierced Him. Who did they pierce? Jesus. The thorn of crowns pierced His head. Nails <coughs> pierced His wrists and His feet. A spear pierced his side. After they realized what they did, after they realized that God, they prayed all this time for a Messiah, and they killed him, killed him, after they realized that, then God will <coughs> continue to pour out his grace upon them. That is a great testament to the love and the mercy and the grace of God. After they realized what they did, he's going to show his grace to them. And Jerusalem is in the news right now. There's lots of turmoil over there. And I believe this passage is going to be fulfilled very soon. Very soon. Um, it's going to hit the Jewish people like a ton of bricks, what they did. And they will come to God. And God will pour out His grace upon them. So we've learned that God is the source of grace. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. And watch this. This is my third point. Grace comes to us through Jesus Christ. Grace comes to us through Jesus Christ. The Father is the source of grace. The Spirit is the spirit of grace. Now we see Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.17 says, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned, through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's overwhelming to think that death has affected from Adam and Eve all the way to now. The mortality rate is 100%. Statistics show that 10 out of 10 people die. If you don't believe me, ask the people in the backyard out here. If you ask and they answer, let me know, because you might need some help. <coughs> so, no one survives. When a baby's born, it's not a question of whether the, ba whether the baby will die. It will most certainly die. It's only a question of when. You think of this world, and the Bible speaks of, in certain places of this world as the land of the living. But maybe it should be called the land of the dead, the land of death. Paul says that the reign of life through Jesus Christ is much more certain. It's much more certain in Jesus Christ. Those of us who have turned our life over to Jesus Christ know that we're going to live forever. This body's going to die, but our spirit is going to live forever. Reign in life forever. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of grace, the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. Grace was the specific reason God for Paul's uh, gratitude. Everything good the Corinthian church experienced, everything the good the Corinthian church had, everything good that you and I have is because of God's grace. <coughs> And that brings me to my fourth point. Yes, there are more than three points in this sermon. As believers, we are heirs of Christ, of grace. Sorry. As believers, we are heirs in grace. 1 Peter 3, 7 says that uh, we are heirs in the grace of life. And Romans 5, 14 tells us that we're no longer under the law, but we're covered by grace. We are covered by grace. 
and we're not under the law. I don't know about you, but I think I am so thankful for that. We don't have to do certain things. We don't have to go to the temple at a certain time. We don't have to sacrifice animals. We don't have to wear certain things. We don't have to eat certain things and not eat certain things. Under the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, they couldn't eat bacon. I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> you don't have to worry about things like that. We are under God's grace. He gave us a law to show us how sinful we are and that we cannot, we cannot keep the law. It's just not within our nature. There are certain groups today that they do their best to try to keep the law. They wear the yarmulke, they wear their, the curly sideburns, and, and uh, they wear tassels on their clothes, and just they, they try to keep the law, but they don't have to do that. I don't know who started that, but they don't have to do that. We are under grace. Romans 5.20 tells us the law came in so that tr the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded more. Grace abounded more. So through Christ, we are heirs of God's grace. And with that in mind, we are to abound in grace. We are to abound in grace. Acts 4.33 says, And with great power gave the apostles witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. This was a result of their attitude, of their obedience to God's word. And it should be our uh, attitude as well. We abound in grace. To experience the fullness of God's grace, what do we do? We put him first. We put him number one in our life, just like the apostles did. And when we do that, what happens? We grow in grace. We grow in grace. So we are heirs in grace, and we grow in grace. Does anybody know how we would grow in grace? Does anybody know? Study God's Word. That's how we grow in grace. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. God intends for us to grow. When we become Christians, we should have, and this should remain throughout our Christian walk, a hunger for God's word. We should want to learn and grow in our walk with God. Read it. Know it. And know what God expects of us. And when we do that, when we learn that, grow in our faith, we will grow in grace. Showing God's grace in our life is a result of that growth. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that have been Christian. I'm not doubting their salvation. They've been Christians for a long time, but they're still spiritual babies. They haven't been growing. Why? Because they don't study God's Word as they should, and they're not growing, they're not experiencing, they're not taking what they learn from God's Word and applying it to their life. That's why we uh, gather together on Wednesday night, and I didn't mention this in the announcements, but we're going through the book of Ephesians on Wednesday nights, and it's a great study. We have great discussion. This past uh, Wednesday, we got through five verses, because the discussion it's just so awesome. We have great discussion. It's not, it's not just me talking like here. It's everybody else talking. And I learn as much as everybody else. I lead the discussion, but it's an awesome thing. So Wednesday nights, I strongly, strongly urge you to join us on Wednesday nights. We learn, we grow, we become more like Christ, and that is our goal. When we do our best to reach that goal, God's grace will without a doubt be seen in our character. And God's grace should be seen in our character. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. 
That's Ephesians 4.29. And Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So that concerns our speech. Two verses. The Bible repeated it. What does that mean? When God, when the Bible repeats something. It's important, right? It's very important. Our speech reflects what's inside of us. The language we use reflects what's in our heart. Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. We're defiled from the inside out, not from the outside in. This would seem to mean that if, that if you use filthy language and your speech is peppered with four-letter words, your heart needs Jesus. And if you claim to be a Christian, that should not even be an option. Your language, your filthy four-letter words should not be something that comes out of your mouth. But that's true, but that also includes constant complaining. That also includes gossip. This includes condescending speech toward others. These are things that should not even be an option for a Christian. Complaining all the time. When someone walks in those doors for the first time and all they hear is complaining. Gossip. Condescending speech. You think they're going to walk back in those doors a second time? I doubt it. Jesus boldly says that these evil things come from our innermost nature. They aren't accidents. They're not mistakes. They reveal how corrupt our fallen nature is. The heart is the source of man's true character. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Where grace is lacking, bitterness abounds. Where grace abounds, forgiveness grows. I'm going to leave you with one story. Some of you may even remember this. On October 2nd, 2006, a man named Charles Carl Roberts entered the West Nickel Mines Amish School <coughs> in Pennsylvania. He carried several weapons, a bag of black powder, two knives, a stun gun, and 600 rounds of ammunition. Using plastic zip ties, he bound 11 girls ages 6 to 15. As he prepared to shoot them, 13-year-old Marion Fisher stepped forward and said, Shoot me first. Her younger sister, Barbie, allegedly asked Roberts to shoot her second. He ended up shooting 10 girls. Then he turned the gun on himself. Three of the girls died immediately, while two others died later in the hospital. The nation was stunned. But the forgiveness of the Amish community stunned us even more. More than half of the people who attended Robert's funeral were Amish. Many, of the, many from the Amish community took food to the Roberts family after the tragic incident. An Amish midwife who had helped raise several of the girls was interviewed and she said, this is a quote, this is only possible if you have Christ in your heart. Amen. That actually happened. Any of you remember that? This kind of forgiveness isn't possible in the world. The world teaches us vengeance. Get back. We're glad he's dead. The Amish, being godly people, step forward in forgiveness. It's contrary to the, what the world teaches. How is your heart? Could you do that? It would be so hard to do. I imagine it wasn't easy for the Amish people to do it, but they did. Out of obedience. How is your heart? Think about the amazing grace God has shown you. Think about the fact that he saved you. And he didn't deserve you didn't deserve it. He saved you because he loves you. Think about that. Does your life, 
your language, your heart, the way you treat and act and love other people, does that reflect the grace of God? Does your life show His amazing grace the way it should be seen? The way He lavishes it upon you? God's amazing grace should be seen in every part of your life, especially when you interact with others, and more importantly, as you inter interact with the lost, with people who are not involved in church. Can they see God's grace in you? As you talk to others every day, what do they hear? Do they hear grumbling? Do they hear complaining? Do they hear gossip? Or even worse, filthy language. Four-letter words that Christians are not to say. Or do others see Jesus in you? Grace challenge. That's something new. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, my challenge. You know I always end my sermons with a challenge. Do others see Jesus in you? Think about that. Do others see Jesus in you? Do they know you're a Christian? Can they see God's love and grace in you? Think about how others view you, hear you, and think about you. Do they hear nothing but complaining? If they do, stop it. Do they hear gossip? Stop it. Say nothing to others. Say nothing about others unless it's positive, uplifting, encouraging. Is there a relationship that needs restored? Does that relationship reflect the grace of God that he has shown you? Have you shown grace to others? Do others see Jesus in you? Let's stand and have a word of invitation. If you need to come forward and pray, as always, this altar is always open. Always open. Come forward and pray if you need to talk to me about salvation. Absolutely do that today. Or baptism or whatever it might be. I'm here for you guys. So, as we sing. Page 59. 59.